This is the Horse Radio Network. It's normal to feel the pressure in competition, but how do you learn to keep your cool in the moment? We asked an expert for help. This week, we're talking about BZ Madden's announcement and our biggest pet peeves in the barn. Thanks for tuning in. From Heels Down Mag, a podcast where horse pros chat about what's happening in the horse world over drinks. Welcome Welcome to Happy Happy Hour. Hour. I'm Justine Griffin. I'm Ellie Wozniaka. And I'm Jessica Payne. Welcome to episode 66 of Heels Down Happy Hour. Oh my gosh, Jess is back. Finally, it feels like it's been forever. I know. I'm so excited to be back. How's How's the baby? They're perfect. Hudson loves his new little baby sister, Abigail, and she is, everyone says the second one's easier. She is definitely easier. She likes to sleep. She likes to eat. So we're all happy about that. You've just had like my kind of baby. (laughs) I feel like you guys have just had like a marathon couple of months because, all right, you had a baby. Then all of a sudden, like, I feel like Doug is in the news everywhere. He won that, like, huge Grand Prix class, which was so cool to see. You guys, have you're just the busiest people I know. Well, I have to tell you, when everybody comes up and congratulates you, I think they're talking about Abigail. Probably 90% of them are congratulating me on Doug's $100,000 Grand Prix win. And I was like, <laughs> oh, right, that too. I forgot. <laughs> That's so funny. Oh, my gosh. They're like, oh, oh, right. Congratulations. You had a baby. You look great. <laughs> oh, my Man, so are you are you on the road with them yet? Or you've been home just relaxing with the babies? No, I couldn't deal with it. I got on the road. We went to Wellington for our first adventure. My dad was very nice. And my dad, if anybody doesn't know, my dad loves to fly. And so he came and picked us up in his plane and we went to Wellington. So I didn't. I wouldn't have been able to drive with the kids by myself or even with people because they would have been miserable, but it was a quick flight down and we had a lot of fun and then quick back home. So yeah, we're all on ready to go. Oh my goodness. Wow. Which by the way, so is it stopped? It sounds like it's raining. Are you both in a place that's raining right now? Oh, I, yeah, it hasn't stopped. It's been, lovely weather in the sense of it's warm down in Aiken like warmer than usual but it hasn't stopped raining and so if some people know sometimes to get away from the children and to get away from it I actually will do these shows in the car so that I have some peace and quiet but then you guys can hear the rain this time so (laughs) cats out of the bag where I'm actually recording from (laughs) One day we'll explain all these bloopers in like a blooper episode so you guys actually know what it's like when we record because (laughs) sometimes it's, you know, it's a journey to bring this episode to you. It is. Good way to describe it. So worth it. So worth it. So worth it. So this episode is brought to you by Smart Pack. If you've listened to our show, you know we are huge fans of Smart Pack. They their website is like my holy grail for anything I ever need for Mikey, from supplements to tack to clothing for me. Smart Pack is my first stop because I love their customer service and they're always competitive on prices. So you should check out Smart Pack by going to smartpackequine.com. All right, Ellie, you got a drink for us this week? I do. So the drink is a Cobra Verde. It's one and one fourth ounce of Midori, half ounce of chili liqueur, half ounce of fresh lemon juice, and then tonic water to top off. And you're going to want to garnish with a sprig of thyme. So you're going to add all the drinks into a Collins glass over ice and stir and then top it with your thyme. That sounds pretty good. It sounds, sounds really good. Sounds know, refreshing. You, exactly. It's like, hey, winter's almost over. It's you, you could almost celebrate that spring is here. Drink something refreshing. Can you drink? Are you drinking now, Jess? Are you back in the real world with us? I can. I can. I'm still breastfeeding a bit, but I can have like a glass of wine. So I, uh, yes, poured myself a glass of wine for this, and it is <laughs> so nice. Awesome. All right, Jess, well, you got news for us? I do. So talking about going into the Olympic year, everybody's been, you know, okay, these are the 
country's going. This is what's happening with the jumping. These are, you know, the definite entries and definite deadlines for these different events to qualify for points for individual people type things. And they've had a little bit of a controversial thing because they had concerns raised for that between the FEI jumping events in France and Syria that the Olympic and Longines ranking points were offered at these shows, a couple of them, and they didn't really meet up to either the definite entries. They were like past that or some of the actual criteria that with regulations and stuff. So they've actually pulled a couple of the events and said that, look, they didn't meet the deadlines. They didn't meet the requirements and they are, they got investigated and I think they're pulling them. So it's pretty interesting. And they've pulled the results from past ones. That is interesting because I know it was, there were a lot of show jumpers who were kind of speaking out about some of the, you know, qualifying events recently, right? That they were almost dumbing down the sport. And so I know people were getting nervous about what, you know, what we would actually see by the time we got to Tokyo. So it sounds like the FEI is responding to some of that, right? Yeah. And they're finally responding and saying like, look, you will lose your team quota place like for Tokyo between these and so they're like going through it and I think a lot's going to happen in a bit that basically they're noticing look these can't just say hey this is an easy competition I'm going to meet my quota for this and they're dealing with it a lot so it's good on that FBI and everything interesting wow all right Ellie what do you got well speaking of the Olympic Games I don't know if you guys saw BZ Madden's article on the Chronicle of the Horse where they interviewed her about kind of her change of focus with the industry. So she's obviously hoping to get to Tokyo, but then she's going to kind of take a step back away from competing and focus more on, you know, developing young horses and younger riders. So that's, you know, it's it's going to be sad to not see her compete quite as much, but she's in, by no means, you know, retiring. So... It is interesting, though, because she's, you know, growing up watching the sport. I mean, she's been to how many Olympics now? I mean, it's it's she's five had an unbe- now. Unbelievable yeah. career, you know? Yeah. yeah. And they and they quoted her saying, I mean, she's literally done everything that you could ever want to do at the top of the level, mm-hmm. you know? So it's it's nice to see her, you know, turning around and kind of giving that back, you know, developing young horses, developing young riders. So it'll be interesting to see, like what she and John Madden do in the future. Yeah. It's really exciting because in the end, like you said, she's giving back and she's taking a step because to what it takes to like be dedicated as if it takes the entire family, entire village, entire everybody to make a run at a games and everything. So it's like, you know, she's taking this to say, look, I'm going to kind of change my business a little bit and focus not on the next championship, but more on something different, which is exciting for her. Absolutely. It'll be cool to see what comes next, like watch it happen. Yeah, absolutely. So what about you, Justine? So I have a really great science story this week. It was in the New York Times and it was just fascinating. So I'll just tell you the headline to give you a little bit of a tease before I tell you about it. The headline is a horse has five toes and then it doesn't. Mm. okay <laughs> it could be wow. like a, a netflix like uh like mystery webisode or something right so yeah <laughs> basically science scientists are saying that something profound happens when a horse's hoof forms so like during the developmental stage and basically when you think of a horse's hoof it's literally a giant middle finger and as the hoof forms when you know like a horse is in utero essentially It basically has a foot that once had five full toes and then only three become visible. And then it's two digits on either side and then a hardened middle digit. It's just so interesting how like over time, how the hoof is created, but it like, it's almost like they have a real foot, like a human type foot where they have five toes. But then as the development continues, it it just morphs into the hoof that we know. So basically a biologist from the University of Massachusetts was sorting through preserved horse embryos and that's when they first found this. And this is a fairly new development. They never realized that this is how horses' toes were formed. But basically in the early days of gestation and where the hoof forms, you could see this cluster of developing cells that represent toes. And there weren't three, there were five. 
It's kind of cool, huh? Huh. Yeah. That's so super I, cool. You learn really something recommend... new every day. <laughs> exactly. I would read, I read the whole story if you're like a science nerd like me. It's You're like, whoa, it's very cool. I think the pictures are really cool in the article. Yeah, because it, right? It's like one thing to read about it, but then when you can visualize it too, you're, it's really interesting to see. Yeah. So that's what I got. But hey, by the way, so we're running a really fun giveaway right now on HeelsDownMag.com. You know, we love Eco Gold on the show. You've heard us review several of their pads. We're going to review another one today. But if you want to get an Eco Gold pad of your own, we are giving away an Eco Gold secure pad, which basically comes in any um, discipline style that you want, dressage, jumping, even Western. And it's you can get it in the color you want to, and that's up to a $250 value. If you write an essay for us and answer this question, we want to know, as an adult amateur, how would you change equestrian sports? I know that's a pretty loaded question, but as riders, you know, we do this as a hobby. Are there things that you've noticed over time riding in the sport that you would like to see change? Or what do you think equestrian sports needs to do now just to evolve? We're really open to hearing all of your ideas and we're going to pick five essays that we'll publish on heelsdownmag.com. And then we will randomly select a winner out of those five finalists. So you have until the end of this month, February 26th, to submit your essay. We want you to keep it under 500 words if possible. And we'll link in the show notes to where you can get more information. But basically, you can send your submission to our email address at hello at heelsdownmedia.com. All right, so this week we are reviewing the Eco Gold Flip Half Pad. Jess, do you guys ride in the Flip Pad? I actually don't have one, but I'm interested. I've always been in the market for one, and especially now with the collars. So I am in the market. But you have one, don't you, Justine? Yes, I have one, and I love it. So What you colors? Know, I have it in, in blue, and it's like this beautiful, royal, like just really classy blue color. I'll, I'll share some pictures in the Facebook group so you guys can see it. But Ellie, I'm sure you've written, you know, I've written in 100 different types of half pads over the years, but I've never written in something quite like Eagle Gold. So the it's fact made... it doesn't slip as well is one of my huge things, because a lot of the half pads or whatever, they'll slide out the back of the saddle and... That right. flip half pad is amazing. And the fact that just like all the different like key kind of components that they didn't miss out on, whether it's like, you know, the inserts for the shims or the withers, um, there's like an opening for it. I, I love this half pad. Same. I really love it too. I don't think I could go back and use another half pad. It's and so exactly what you're saying. Like you get that classic no slip guarantee that you get from all Eco Gold products. But what I like about it is the high resistance foam. When you like when I got it, I was surprised at how thick the pad was. But it, it just it's amazing how it condenses. So like when I put my put it on and then put my saddle on it, you'll see the foam it like it will condense and it creates this like thick layer that really helps with like pressure points and it's a wonderful shock absorber. But then the second I, you know, I take the saddle off, the the pad goes whoop. And it, it just like it, where it sunk down from the weight of my saddle and probably the weight of me in the saddle, it pops right back up. It's really interesting. It's just like a really unbelievably durable, high density foam. It's pretty cool, but it's, it's super easy to care for. Cause then I was like, oh my gosh, this is the nicest saddle pad I own. How can I like <laughs> not ruin it in the wash? Right. But it's, you just can throw it in your washer. I just wash it on like a cold cycle. You can put OxyClean on it if you've got stains. And I just wash it on like cold and a gentle cycle. And it comes out looking beautiful. You don't even have to take any of the shims out. If you have shims or any of the foam, you, I just wash it how it is. It comes out looking great. It has wonderful air vents. You know, like some of the sheepskin pads, the, like I feel like they get so hot under my saddle where the Eco Gold pad has vents everywhere. So it's very airy and light that way. And then obviously the best thing about the flip pad is it flips in that you get two pads in one. You get It's reversible. So you can get like a nice conservative black or white color on one side. And then you can get a fun color like the blue. Then you can go crazy. Exactly. And Eagle Gold, they're expanding and having so many different colors now. Like you can really customize for your cross country colors or whatever color you want. Well, I like you can do one side cross country and then you can do one side kind of classic. 
so you can be like, okay, look, I can use it in all the different phases. So you can go show jumping. I'm not a big colors person for show jumping. So you can do show jumping in a classic like white or black, and then you can do something fun on the other side. Exactly. And, if you, and everybody's always like scared of the white pads or whatever. Like we obviously we love our white eagle gold pads or the half pads. The trick with the OxyClean, you can actually just take the OxyClean and rub it on the mark, like the black mark or whatever from your billets or something, and then wash it off. And they dry so fast, you don't even have to throw them in the washing machine necessarily if you're in a rush. Huh. That's yeah, a good trick. A little trick. Yeah. That is I'm going to use trick. that. I have the secure pad, the jumper one, and I, I'm going to try that, actually, because I always, my boots always leave marks. Yep. I mean, it is what it is, right? They're going to get dirty, so that's good to know. Well, exactly. So yeah, if you want to check out a flip pad of your own, you can go to equalgold.ca. Okay, we're really excited to have Dr. Gabby Ledger back on the show with us. She's a physician from Ontario, Canada, and she's been a family medical care practitioner and a child psychiatrist. She's also an equestrian who competes at the intermediate and one-star level in eventing, so... Hi, Dr. Ledger. Thank you for coming back. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me back. Hey. hey. Good to talk to you. <laughs> nice to chat with you guys. So I have a couple questions, like, get us started and talking about, like, kind of the pressure we put on ourselves. And as myself as, like, a trainer, I put pressure on myself, like, even when my students are competing and pressure on them as well. So what is kind of too much pressure when you're kind of talking about it? Yeah, that's such a good question because I, I think it's really, in, in a way, there's one answer for, for everybody and in another way, like, the answer is different for everybody because the, it'll be a different amount of pressure. But yeah. really, the, the amount of pressure that creates dysfunction, so an inability to, to do your job or function, whether it's in your role as an equestrian athlete or, like, are you trashing your relationships all around you because you can't handle the, the pressure or... You know, are you, is your life falling apart because you're not functioning? Then it's too much for sure. So basically, like, when, as a trainer and stuff like that, and as a, as a competitor, but, like, for myself, recently I've had, like, a lot of students kind of moving up the levels and, like, doing all this. And, like, you want to put the pressure so that they do it. And it was really interesting. I had a student the other day kind of moving up, and she's, like, you know, I feel completely ready. And she hundred percent was. And I said, you know, she's like, but I'm a little nervous. It was like a level she'd never gone to. And I was like, I said to her, I think you should be a little nervous. Like, I don't want you to be too cocky that you take it for granted. And is that kind of, I know it's not a right or wrong thing, but for me, I was like, this is what I'd want somebody to tell me is like, you are going to feel nervous and it's not going to go a hundred percent sometimes, but that is okay. And it's all about, you know, making sure you put the ample amount of pressure and stuff on yourself, but without being too cocky because, you know, with eventing or show jumping or something, it is risk. So you want to make sure you are still paying attention and not like, oh, I can do this. This is no big deal. Because you do need to take it a little bit, you know, like at what it is. Yeah, yeah. It's a competitive sport and, and you need some pressure, but not so much pressure or so little ability to manage the pressure that you fall apart under the pressure. So there, there's like this sweet spot in the middle. And then, you know, there's a, there's going to be a lot of external factors that, you know, an individual can't really control directly themselves, but they can learn to fine tune how they respond to all of those circumstances that like are out of their control, the facts of the situation. And that can actually make all the difference when it comes to making sure the pressure is like within a tolerable and even a beneficial range rather than, non-existent and or like so much that's impaired so how can someone find that sweet spot because some pressure can be good right I mean Mm -hmm. for me working with you know other people's horses and breaking them right they have certain level that they expect the horse to be returned at you know and each horse you know takes its own time whether it's going to be you know a month or two months so how can you kind of rise to that occasion without putting yourself beyond the point of return. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like how do you, how do you find the right, the right amount of pressure to put on yourself 
and not exactly. go overboard or underboard. Is that a word, underboard? I don't even know. Um, <laughs> yeah. So you can you can kind of look to what are the types of what are the types of difficulties that I've had. Like in in say, let's go back my last six months of history doing the job of breaking and training horses. Am I am I tripping up because I'm not investing the attention, or I'm not investing the attention to detail, the effort, or you know the focus really? And that might suggest to you that like things have gotten too easy and you're kind of coasting at this point and, and you need to start you know, setting your bar a bit higher or challenging yourself a little bit more to remain engaged. Or are you having a different type of difficulties where, you know, you know that your preparation is solid and then, you know, on I don't know, I'm just making up a scenario, but say an owner comes to visit their horse in training and then suddenly everything falls apart and you're not able to show off, you know, that what you guys have established together, maybe that's telling you that the, the pressure is actually a little bit too much and you need to find a way to manage that pressure. Oh, I really like that. That's a good... <laughs> huh. any, I can see you why any... you're a psychiatrist now. <laughs> but do you have any good tips of kind of like for the listeners and stuff of how to kind of manage that pressure and stuff? I really think like this is probably true for maybe anything mentally related that we could do a podcast on, but I think the very most important piece is to know yourself. And not all of us are born with that ingrained kind of insight into our personalities and our strengths and our weaknesses and our patterns. But so the first step for anybody who's trying to sort of address a pressure problem would be find out where you are succumbing to pressure and find out where you are in control of the pressure, but using it in a negative way against yourself. So, so, and that might be something that, you know, you sit down with your coach and you talk with them about, you know, have you seen me doing this or that? Or, or do you feel as though I'm, I'm understanding or I'm managing the pressure the way I should? Um, what do you, what do you perceive are the things that I find more difficult in the show settings, that, those kinds of conversations so that first you can understand where you're at. And then there's really like, there's infinite numbers of things that you can do to fine tune the amount of pressure that you perceive once you've figured out, you know, where it's coming from and what you're doing to either make it better or worse. So what about, I mean, I think people have all different types of definitions of pressure, so, Dr. Ledger, how would you define the difference of, you know, between pressure and, say, something like anxiety or fear, right? Because yeah. all of that kind of gets muddled together when you're in that moment before, you know, before you walk into the arena. Totally. And that's why that was, like, an interesting discussion in our house last night, trying to, <laughs> trying to think about this question and really how to answer it. So, I, I think what it came down to for me in, in contemplating this was that like the pressure itself is more of a situation, which is like the result of a combination of maybe like internal factors and also external factors, you know, like how, how big are the stakes and how is my most recent performance compared to this and what does that do to how I think about this and so on. So the pressure is like almost the situation and the anxiety and fear are the emotions that result from your interpretation of the situation. Interesting. That makes sense. So kind of going on that same vein, like, so say you're moving up a level and you're feeling that pressure of, okay, I'm moving up to this next level. It's going to be a little bit more difficult. The jumps are going to be a little bit bigger. How much excitement should you feel, right? Versus trepidation, mm -hmm. you know, is there, is there like a good balance? Like, yeah, you should be excited, but some, some fear too is healthy as well. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, and I think again, I feel like I'm sort of starting all of my questions or my answers with this whole idea that we're all really individual in this. But there are some people who will who will look at really daunting tasks or or you know tests and will respond to it with a lot of like that pumped up, happy, excited, I can't wait to get at it kind of feeling versus you know somebody feeling really quite even physically sick from how anxious and nervous they are about it. But you, you can't necessarily tell the difference between those groups in terms of who's going to be more successful at it. So, but there will be some people who, you know, they, they don't feel a lot of nervousness, fear, anxiety, not feeling well, 
and they don't do a really great job at the task or the test. Whereas there's other people who will feel really, really sick and that some of them it'll be because frankly they're not ready and they like realistically are feeling nervous because this is not really going to be a good thing. Mm -hmm. Or they might be among that group of people that, you know, they're so good and they're so conscientious that they're almost overprepared, that they're that group of people that went into exams and like literally legitimately walked out of there thinking they'd done terribly and then pulled off an A plus every time. Like that, there's a group of people who are just like that and it's not an intentional thing, but they might feel really, really nervous, but still be very well placed to do a really good job in, in whatever, you know, circumstances testing them. So it's almost like you just got to get through it to realize like, yeah, I was prepared for this. Yeah, and maybe you have to ask for some feedback from the people you trust who are, you know, hopefully your coach, hopefully you're working with the coach, but you know, the people who, who you trust who are around you who might have thoughts about all this or, or uh, might have observed this kind of stuff. But yeah, you, do, you have to know yourself. And if you know that you always throw up on cross country day before you get on and you throw up on cross country day before you get on, well, maybe that's just you and that's how you feel in that moment, but it's not going to have a negative impact on your functioning or the job you do at on cross country or, you know, make you feel terrible in other ways that would, that would be negative overall. So you have to know how, what's normal for you and what's going to bring out the best in you. Hmm. Is it possible to be addicted to the feeling like the, the, we can do this, let's go kind of feeling that comes with pressure? Yeah. Why, like how... How is that possible if you're so terrified in the same time? You know what I mean? So it's so funny because there's, there's, I mean, that's the adrenaline. And to some degree, when you finish the, the event or the, the competition, like to some degree, it's also that dopamine hit of accomplishment and, and you get a bigger hit of dopamine if it's a bigger accomplishment. But there are some people who feel like their brains are basically like chronically a little bit understimulated. And their personality is one that like seeks out thrill and excitement and, and they're called sensation seekers. Like there's, there's psychological research on this group of people and they can certainly become addicted to adrenaline the same way, um, you know, that same group of people are also a little bit more vulnerable to having addictions issues and so on. Interesting. And, yeah. There's also, there's a lot of overlap with ADHD. So um, and I say this from a, comp uh, like, I, I completely don't want to say anything inflammatory about ADHD, but people with ADHD, like their prefrontal cortex, that part of the brain right behind, behind the forehead bone, it, it's like a little bit uh, not alert enough. So it's not doing a good enough job of helping you to sober second thought decisions and, and slow things down. And the, it's just a little under aroused. That's why medications like stimulants help people with ADHD to focus and to, you know, not blur things out and so on. But those people are, are genuinely drawn to adrenaline sports. And if you interview, you know, the, the guys competing in the X Games and stuff, there's a lot of them who you know, are, are finding that they feel really well under that intense amount of adrenaline and they, and they seek it out. And then, and the, yeah, and then like probably the other 80%, like we kind of get hooked on that feeling when you cross the finish line, right? And like the, the, stress is resolving and there's that sense of like look at what we did under pressure you and me my horse partner and and like you know the sense of achievement and like that thrill that can stay with you for weeks after a great ride and that's probably most of us who get addicted to to the pressure it's probably that after the event pressure they're mm -hmm. feeling it totally makes sense all right well i feel like i am now equipped <laughs> To, to not freak out at my next event. <laughs> You'll be okay. If you keep going out there and you win every time, even though you throw up, like, I, I guess You're that's fine. how you manage it, right? Like, don't don't puke so much you get dehydrated. But otherwise, go out there and, and go win. And you're in good company. Like, I think even Kim Severson said that she feels sick on cross-country day, right? Yeah, yeah, she did. Yeah. Good mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. All right, Gabby. Well, thank you so much. This has been super interesting. Yeah, it's a, it's a neat topic in that overlap with anxiety versus just situational stuff and how you interpret it. Right, definitely. So I've got one more weirdo question for you. We recently had an interesting conversation in our Facebook group about people's biggest pet peeves that they have in the barn. And, it, you know, there's always something that annoys us, right? You know, like little things that just get under your skin. But since we had you on the show today, I just wanted to ask... Why do you think people get so mad about small things? Like, what is it about pet peeves that just, you know, 
send someone like over the edge bonkers about something small. Yeah. And is it, is it like a learned thing where somebody saw something really dangerous happen and therefore that's ingrained in them? So like, I can't stand looped chain lead shanks because I, I saw a woman grazing a horse and having a foot go through the loop and then and like, you know, terrible stuff happened. And so it's a pet peeve of mine. I can't walk by it innocuously. Like it's a little, I'll, I'll think about it for hours. And then sometimes it, I think it can also just be like more of an instinctive, like direct to your emotional brain rather than your cortical brain kind of a response. Like, you know, when, if somebody doesn't clean up after their horse in the aisle and they leave like a big pile of poop, it's just sort of like a direct, oh, that's rude. Or I don't know, just the same way that somebody chewing loudly around other people can really get some people fired up. I think sometimes there when, there are moments like that where uh, you can really not stand something, but without having had some logical reason to develop that feeling. All right. That makes sense to me. <laughs> and whoever said the uh, halters hanging on the cross ties, totally. I don't know why, but I can't deal with that either. Yeah, that was a common <laughs> one. I feel like that was the universal one that everyone was like, no, don't do that, you know? Yeah. I can't deal with any of those things. That's why I bought my own <laughs> Me <too>. farm. <laughs> Done with it. Yeah. Plus, it's so, like, I went from being a working student, you know, kind of doing that life, and then I went back to being a boarder. And, and once you've, like, worked really, really hard at a really great barn, it's, it's really hard to be a boarder after that. Oh, I bet. Oh, my goodness. All right. Well, thanks again, Gabby. This was awesome. It's always great to have you on. Okay. So what are your biggest pet peeves, guys? I mean, Gabby went with the lead shank and also, you know, the cross ties, the halter and the cross ties. That drives me crazy, too. But what are... Jess, why don't you start us out? What's your biggest barn pet peeve? I guess my biggest barn pet peeve would be more so like just leaving things you know like if there's poop or whatever else and like I'll just walk behind them and go do it myself but like kind of cleaning up and everything after you and not just not necessarily like leaving it a mess but like if your horse poops like go right away and just go pick up the poop like why leave it it's just gonna do that that's kind of my kind of pet peeves I do not like the whole change like lead rope that Gabby was just talking about that drives me nuts but my answer to that is not using a lead rope so I don't know if that's really the correct answer but <laughs> you know like the dentist was there today yep. and he's like where's your lead rope I'm like oh like he needed it and I was like oh I gotta go get one like I don't really use those <laughs> and I brought him in from the field was the bad part so I was like oh, oh. really bad I didn't even just, yeah, I'm really bad about lead ropes. And so you're somebody sort of else's thing. pet peeve. Oh, I am all kinds of everybody's <laughs> pet peeve. I mean, I have like loose horses all the time and I'm shocked they left every time. I mean, I am, that's probably it. I am the pet peeve. So right. mine are very probably irrelevant. I'm pretty sure I am the pet peeve. So that's probably what we should go at. What about you, Ellie? I have so many pet peeves. <laughs> Which, you know, like I said, is why I abandoned the boarding ship. But I think my biggest pet peeve would have to be, like, the absence of horsemanship altogether. Like, you know, the kids whose parents tack up for them and they, like, just sit in the car, like, waiting to warm up and then just, you know, get on and ride. Like, that part really bothers me. Just, like, the lack of horsemanship knowledge, you know? It's one thing when you have established yourself as you know, a professional rider to have grooms, you know, who work hard for you and you respect them. And it's another thing to just, you know, expect your horses to be handed to you at the mounting block kind of thing. But I also like one of my biggest pet peeves is like when people don't walk their horses enough to warm up and cool down people who just get on and then like, you know, they walk halfway around the arena and they're like, all right. And they're off to trotting off to cantering. And I'm like, your horse's muscles have to stretch out a little bit. That really bothers me. <laughs> oh my gosh. I could I could keep going, Justine, but what's yours? Definitely like just where I just like someone has to clean up. Like I'm the type of person that every time the horse comes out of the trailer, I've gotta I've gotta sweep it. I can't leave poop in my trailer. I just I hate that. So that's my biggest pet peeve is like you come home from the horse show and you're like, oh, I'll just leave it for a couple of days and clean out the trailer. I'm, I'm like no. the person who is exhausted from the horse show, but I have to clean it out. You know, you just can't leave it like that. 
But yeah, that's you like especially can't do that up here because the poop will freeze and then you'll never get it out. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, the real that's thing. Funny. I believe it. But yeah, I mean, beyond that, I'm, I'm with you guys on all the other common ones that you know. Or something that also drives me crazy is when someone doesn't use a like a saddle pad that fits their saddle, like one that's slipping all over the place, or it's just like monstrously too big or too small. Do you know what I'm talking about? Or you just look at it and you're like, yes. isn't there a better saddle yeah. pad you could be using? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel like that's being really picky. But <laughs> Yeah. Well, no, or polo wraps when they're like really not done right at all. And oh, that makes it like me hurts sad. your eyes. Yeah, <laughs> it makes me kind of sick. <laughs> yep, definitely. But yeah, so we we asked this question in the Facebook group, which is the Heels Down Happy Hour Podcast Lounge, and man, you guys really delivered. It was an interesting thread of <laughs> of gripes and venting and complaining. But but yeah, I feel like we were all behind each other in our pet peeves. <laughs> so. You guys should totally try Barn Cat Hero Coffee. I don't even like coffee, but I like this coffee. It's fair trade certified and organic certified. Wake up purring. You should check it out at barncathero.com. Speaking of barn cats, my barn cats are my rose this week, ladies. Because the two that I found on the side of the road, who are Luke and Leia... That was Matt's rule, that if he could name them, then I could keep them. So we have Star Wars kittens now. But they just moved out to the barn, and I was really nervous that my old barn cat wasn't going to like them or like that they were going to bully him because he's really old and not very smart. But they all are getting along, and in fact, the old barn cat is acting like a total kitten. Like, I'll have to share a video in the Facebook lounge because he runs around like a lunatic. It is the cutest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> Aw, that's so cute. But, so how many cats are you up to now? Yeah, I'm scared. Okay, I don't, I don't really want to talk about it. So I have <laughs> six total. Uh, so three at the barn and three in your house? Yes. Well, at least it's like an even ratio. Yeah, it's half and half. So it's like really only three, right? Like you only exactly. see three at a time. Yeah. Right, right. To Matt. Like you only see three of them at a time. So we only have three. Yeah. And he likes the outside kittens for some reason, but he won't pet a cat unless he has gloves on. Oh my gosh. <laughs> He's got what? Like, he does not like them. He's got like those, like, you know, hawk gloves that he'll wear if he wants to play with the inside kittens. But it's, it's pretty funny. It's, but awesome. I do have a really. I have a really sucky thorn, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So for Matt's birthday, which was last September, I bought us tickets to the traveling Broadway theater shows at our local theater. And so it was five shows total. And we saw the first two and they were awesome. And we were going to go see the third one, which was a play that goes wrong, which we were excited to see because it was really funny, supposedly. I don't know if it was actually funny because Matt and I both forgot about it. And so we missed it completely. So oh, there's, no. you know. What? Yeah. Yeah. That's, we both have been sucks. crazy. I mean, he's an accountant. It's tax season. I've been running around with a chicken or like a chicken. <laughs> no, I've not been running around. With I'm like, you got a chicken too? You have chicken and cats. <laughs> Oh my god. If that doesn't describe why we mixed the show, I think that I can't describe it any better. <laughs> so how about you guys? Just you go. Okay. So I'm so excited I get to play Rose and Thorn again. It's been forever, it feels like. So my rose would have to be that I had Abigail and everything went well. And today I actually, like for everybody... I got clear that I can actually ride and like go back to exercising and everything again. So I'm really excited. It's been forever that I've been able to ride. So I'm really super excited that tomorrow I get to get back on a horse finally. So I'm really excited about that. And who's going to be your first horse back? Since I had to sell all mine. I'm just kidding. Maybe that was my thorn <laughs> last time. So that I'm actually getting on my parents' two horses first. Oh, okay. So oh, cool. They will be mine. Yeah, so they will be mine tomorrow. So I'm gonna help 
I, we have a great group of people that have, uh, we've hired to kind of like ride a bunch of my horses and stuff and help dug out. So they're going to still stick around because I'm going to kind of just test it. So if I have to jump off real quick, cause I've got the babysitter and stuff. So I'm going to take my parents to horses because then if I cut them short, I don't really feel bad basically. So everyone's going to kind of keep going with what they're doing and I'm going to kind of take the week easy and see where we're going basically. Gotcha. Awesome. That's exciting. I know. Yeah. So we'll see. Very cool. And then I guess my thorn, I forgot to have to have a thorn. My thorn will probably be that I'm going to be sore tomorrow, <laughs> but <laughs> probably going to be like, oh my gosh, I died. But I haven't ridden in forever. But uh, yeah, I guess that's probably going to be my thorn or that my lack of sleep. We're still kind of, you know, with having a newborn, she sleeps way, way better than Hudson. So that probably should have been my rose as well, but it's still, you know, waking up in the middle of the night, not having a good night's sleep, that still takes a toll on you. So I got a couple more months of that, but I still, it's worth it. And she's pretty precious. So I'll take it any day. Oh, no. Justine, what are yours? How about you, Justine? Um... I kind of know Justine Thorne. Oh, you do? Why don't you guess? I feel like it. I feel like that you didn't know that you had to do A and B. Oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah. That's a good one. <laughs> so, oh, so I had no it, idea. I felt okay. so bad for you. I know. I mean, it's I my watched. own fault. So yeah, but uh, I watched and I was like, oh man, it's not it was, cross country. I know. And he got me good. So, okay. He, so he, I, did, he was bad. That should be actually your thwart is that he was naughty. I mean, I was, I just felt when he, okay, so let me explain for people who don't know. Yeah, right, that we're having a conversation and everyone has a clue. (laughs) So I took my horse to an event over the weekend, and it was our second time out at Novice, and uh, uh, it was not great. I just, the whole day was just, like, not great. I mean, like, we, he, his dressage is getting so consistent, he's, like, wonderful to ride on the flat. But then I, I just, like, forgot a 20-meter circle in the middle of the test. Like, so I had an error on my dressage test. So I was oh. was pissed about that. And then I go to stadium, and we had a refusal in a, in a one-stride combination. And so – and he just – he, like, weighed – we were going so fast, I didn't realize he'd have time or the room to stop. But he just, like – he just re- – like, you could see the earth fly up from his – feet digging into the ground you know he stopped good I was happy I stayed on to be honest but then Mm I I turned around to to jump again and I just jumped the fence he refused you know because I was thinking of you can't cross your tracks you know I'm new to all these eventing rules so I just did the out fence the b option and I got eliminated because apparently you have to do the whole combination since it was an a b thing so I learned the hard way that that's that's the rules in eventing and (laughs) it was just you know it was one of those horse shows that were like tough on the face value of it because he had a couple they let me it was a schooling show so they let me still run cross country and he had he had a stop on cross country too so then i was just like mad annoyed yeah i was like where is this coming from so it's time to you know go back to the drawing board and address some of these I think it's a confidence issue. I think he's like, he's just this big gangly horse. And I think when he gets up too close to something like, you know, like a one stride, I feel like he jumped in real big and then he didn't have a whole lot of room to put a stride in and jump out, you know? And so I don't know, I gotta, I gotta address what's going on. But yeah, so it was one of those horse shows where you're like, nah, it wasn't, I wish I did better, but my mind is working on what are the next things, right? Like, how do I get better from this moment? So it's a good learning, a good lo- learning moment for me. But I have a funny story about that horse show. So I'll just make that my rose. So I, you know, I went with my trainer and a few other ladies from the barn. And then my husband, Alex, drove out to meet me, but didn't get up at the, you know, butt crack of dawn. He like came when, because he, he loves eventing because he has a ride time to show up at. It's not like the Hunter shows where he has to sit there for six hours and we never know when I'm going to ride, right? So he came just to watch me ride. And so he got there and spent an hour 
trying to find me <laughs> at the oh, horse show because no. <laughs> I had you know I had my phone but you know what it's like when you're at a horse show I'm running around doing a thousand things I'm trying to help everyone else at my barn while they're riding I just did not have my phone on me and I had no service anywhere anyway because we we're out in the middle of nowhere and so poor Alex is just like wandering around the horse show trying to find me and he was called me a million times and literally it took him an hour before he found me and he kept going and he told me, he was like, I couldn't find you. And then I would think like, maybe, you know, you're riding that horse. That horse is brown. And all he's like, all of the riders look exactly the same. You're all blonde, white oh, women no. with your hair tucked in your helmet. <laughs> That's <laughs> he amazing. Couldn't even, he couldn't even find me because he thought we all looked exactly the same. <laughs> that is hysterical. <laughs> I know. We laughed. And it's funny because my trainer is blonde and then the two other girls who rode with us are blonde, <laughs> too. So it's like we couldn't even, like, be mad at him, you know? It's like uh, you're not far off. Yes, we are all blonde, <laughs> apparently. Yeah. yeah. So that'll be my That's rose. Because awesome. it made me laugh. <laughs> that is great. That's when Doug's like, you need your watch on. Because I never have my phone. Or if I have my phone, it's on silent. So that's right. when he's like, you need your watch. It drives me nuts. You never answer your phone. I'm like... I know I push like the silent button so I can't even hear it. Right, right. No, and I had my watch on too, actually, but I had no service. So I think that was the problem. Oh, that's probably the bigger problem. Yeah. So, but he found me eventually. So, but hey, we have a good mailbag question this week from Jessica. She posted. And it wasn't, it wasn't me because you guys have got to go on the Facebook group and find this because it is the funniest thing, by the way. Just saying. So not just pain, but another Jessica. Not just pain, other Jessica. And she asked, what's the most unusual thing that's shown up at your barn? And she posted this video with it of <laughs> a sheep and a dog. At, like they're like a buddy combo and they showed up at the barn randomly and the sheep follows the dog everywhere and they were actually wearing matching collars. It's too funny. <laughs> it's so cute. So do you guys have a, like what's the weirdest thing that's ever shown up at your barn? I mean, I would say does it cat. have to be a living? <laughs> they but keep showing like up at mine mean. too. Yeah, I'm like that's mean because it's like not the most unusual thing that's ever shown up at Ellie's barn. Because that's like every day. <laughs> they, it and, doesn't and have like to more be a strays creature. keep coming, guys. It could be anything. Yeah, I was gonna say, does it have to be a living thing? But what's so... shown up to your barn not living? That's weird. <laughs> oh boy. I'm not okay, because I. So I live out in the boondocks, right? So I'm walking from my, you know, back fence, which is 50 yards from the barn door. And for some reason, my dogs, like, just dart, like, straight towards the door. And I'm like, that's really weird. Because usually, you know, they go out, they they pee on things and, you know, our dogs, right? And they'll see a deer and they'll chase that or whatever. But they, like, both run to the door and then they start like eating something i'm like what the heck is that well a coyote brought this big piece of meat like a hip bone or something of like a deer i think but it was enormous and i it's kind of scary to think that coyotes were that close to my barn like because that's pretty close to my house you know so that was the most unusual thing i then had to get it away from the dogs and I didn't want to touch it either. So I'm like carrying it out to the, the woods. Like, ugh. So that would probably be the most unusual thing. So Justine, what's the strangest thing that shown up to your barn? Living or non-living? Oh man. I mean, just, I don't have anything that creative or that gory like Ellie. <laughs> it's all pretty no. like, pretty normal things. Like there was a bobcat that that like came seasonally to one of my barns every year. He always came at the end of winter always. And then another barn I was at for a long time, we had like a family of foxes that like the barn was up against a nature preserve with a bunch of trails. And we always had a family of foxes that lived in um, the back pasture, which was really cool to Mm. see them with their babies. But, and then in South Florida, a farm down there they're they're like these little tiny burrowing owls that are protected i think they're endangered and so the farm i worked at they like the state came out and had to like fence off their little burrowing nests area and they were like out in the pastures and it was pretty cool 
Yeah, it was cool. So they just like lived out in the pastures all the time and you would just see all these like they're so small. They're like the size of like a candle and they just like hop around on the ground. But you'd see like eight or nine out little owls, burrowing owls all the time. So that's all I got. Oh, it's so cute. I know. But what about you, Jess, beyond cats? Um, I mean, I thought that was me. I mean, I really have cats or I don't know. I don't really have anything strange that shows up to our barn because I think if it was, I'd kick it out and then I forgot about it. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> you know, like, you know, unusual things people brought or whatever would be like, no. I mean, when people drop off horses, we're like, we need their blankets and the horse. That's it. Nothing else. Yeah. Don't need anything. So no snakes, nothing gross or scary. Oh, we did have, I don't know if this counts as our barn. Our house is next to the barn. So I guess this could count. But one day, Doug all of a sudden went running inside and was like, get the kids in, keep the kids and the dog inside. And like my little dog. And I was like, oh God, like something's showing up here. And I was like, what are you doing? And all of a sudden I heard our guns go off. And I was like, like a gunshot. And I was like, what? There was a rattlesnake feet from my garage and i have oh. two big dogs my little oh. chihuahua that, yeah my chihuahua that everyone knows i mean she's 13 years old i've had her since she was eight weeks old and obviously my it was just hudson at the time but i was it was so scary the rattlesnake was like literally feet from our garage and it's like the garage where hudson goes out our big dogs live in everything and it showed up so that was the scariest thing that showed up to our house but slash barn but other than that not really unusual so doug killed it though so that was good but it was gross oh (laughs) jeez yeah well so if you have a question you'd like for us to answer on the show you can always send us an email by going to hello at heelsdownmedia.com or again you can join our facebook group that's the heels down happy hour podcast lounge and if you want to hear more from us at Heels Down Mag, you should sign up for the Heels Down Brief, our daily morning news blast. You can do that by going to bit.ly slash hdbrief. And we want to say thanks to our partners this week, Smart Pack and Equal Gold, and also Barn Cat Hero Coffee. And all right, guys, that's a wrap. Cheers to Cheers. Jess's first Cheers. episode back. Yay, I'm glad to be back. Cheers. 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 <laughs>